Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is James Martinez. I'm an editor at the Associated Press and a member of the Deadline Club board. In keeping with our Deadline Club Awards tradition, instead of a speech, we offer journalists in conversation. And tonight we have two great ones with us. Joining us from the Philippines by Zoom is Maria Ressa, co-founder and executive editor of the online news organization Rappler.com. Maria was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize last year for being a fearless defender of the freedom of expression in exposing abuses of power and authoritarianism under Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. She focused attention on Duterte's murderous anti-drug campaign and documented how social media were being used to spread fake news, harass opponents, and manipulate public discourse. For speaking truth to power, Maria has been subjected to continual harassment by the state. It's including her arrest on 10 charges related to her reporting and a conviction for cyber libel that she is currently appealing. A journalist in Asia for more than 35 years, Maria was previously a CNN bureau chief and investigative reporter, and her many honors include being a Time Person of the Year and a fellow of the Society of Professional Journalists. Her next book has a fitting title, How to Stand Up to a Dictator. Leading the questioning tonight is David Rode, himself a distinguished and courageous international correspondent. He's executive editor for news of NewYorker.com and a former reporter for Reuters, The New York Times, and The Christian Science Monitor. He was awarded a Pulitzer Prize in 1996 for stories that helped expose the Srebrenica massacre during the war in Bosnia. And in 2009, he shared a Pulitzer with a team of Times reporters for coverage of Afghanistan and Pakistan. His books include A Rope and a Prayer, a harrowing account of being kidnapped by the Taliban for seven months and managing to escape. We're looking forward to a lively discussion and we'll save a few minutes at the end for some questions. So with that, I give you, via, via Zoom and in person, Maria Ressa and David Rode. Hi, Maria. Um, I'm hi, really, David. hi, how are you? Good morning. It's 12 hours ahead of us in Manila, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will say I'm extremely nervous right now. I've never interviewed a Nobel laureate before, particularly someone as brilliant and brave as you. So thank you so much for all you've done already for journalism. I don't know what to say, but still the scream, you know? So please, looking forward to the conversation. So it, this is an amazing moment um, in the Philippines, and I want to uh, set this out very clearly. The Philippines, this is basic stuff for you, Maria, but for the audience here, and I'm, I'm no expert on the Philippines. The Philippines, a nation of 110 million people, is the oldest democracy in Southeast Asia, and I would argue that the Rappler and other brave reporters in the Philippines are, are one of the most innovative and most important news organizations in the world. And it's, we're so lucky to be able to talk to you now about the election that just occurred in the Philippines. Um, the Rappler um, led a magnificent effort with 16 other news organizations to try to track disinformation in this pivotal election one of the most pivotal elections in Philippines history. Um, you've got a million, um, I will stop talking and you can, can tell us more, but there is no journalist I think in the world who understands the challenge of covering disinformation and convincing the public to believe journalists, to believe Maria and her staff at the Rappler, to believe all of us. And just in this election, and I'm sorry, you know, many people may know this already, 80% turnout in the Philippines. Uh, you know, President Duterte, um, term limited, who arrested you, Maria, 
unable to pursue another term. So it was an election between Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the son of the former dictator, um, and um, Lena Rigoberto, who was the, the vice president and a, a sort of ally of the press. And in a stunning outcome, these two ran against each other four, five years ago, excuse me, it was a dead heat that Marcos uh, narrowly lost, that's five years ago, and in the election just a few days ago, um, you know, Marcos won in a landslide, the largest victory margin in the Philippines in 30 years. Um, you know, and, I, and many people, many reporters talked about the Marcos political machine putting out disinformation. So, Maria, I just want to ask you about the result. An overwhelming victory for Marcos. You know, how, how did this happen? Was the election stolen? Did the disinformation campaigns work? Uh, Marcos claimed that, that his father's rule was a golden age for the Philippines, when in fact there was rampant corruption and oppression. So what does this victory mean? How did Marcos win by such a large margin? You know, if there is still any doubt that disinformation has an impact, this is it. Uh, I've been saying uh, that, you know, let me start with just elections and then I'll go back back in time, right? Uh, I think the results here are emblematic of what is happening globally in the Nobel lecture in December last year. I warned about um, the impact of repeated lies, right? I mean, journalists, television news in particular knows the layering changes perception. I mean, I grew up at an age where there was still academics were talking about the breaking news and the CNN effect. If you guys know, this is my 36th year as a journalist, the 36, 36 years after the People Power Revolt that ousted uh, Ferdinand Marcos and, and forced his family into exile in Hawaii. And it is, um, this is like watching a, a, a train wreck in slow motion. Starting in 2016, uh, we began to see the corruption of our information ecosystem. And we flagged it early uh, by November, December of 2016. I remember being in, where, which one? Probably it was Google in Mountain View saying, you know, this is happening. Anger and hate is being used and is, is being used to pound people to silence, right? It's not a free speech issue, but what was happening is free speech was being used to stifle free speech because when you're the target of attack, i.e. when you question or where you have a narrative that power doesn't want, all they do is exponentially pound you to silence. That's the first step. The second step is replace that narrative, right? I mean, whether it is the Philippines or or the United States, or going back and, you know, I, I wrote Crimea December last year into the prologue. Going back there, what happened? Suppress, repress, step one, step two, replace. That's what has been happening globally. In 2016, the Philippines was the first domino to fall with the election of Duterte. So this is, let's say, you know, that it really began information operations or in many instances, information warfare, the attack on the minds of people in a democracy on these social media platforms, that began really in 2014, when we saw experimentation of countries of Russia, Russian disinformation, splinter the world with two realities in the, uh, around the annexation of Crimea. And this is all documented, right? And then by 2016, the impact on politics be became clearer. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower called the Philippines the petri dish. He said that Cambridge Analytica and its parent company, SCL, had been experimenting with tactics of mass manipulation here. And when they worked, he said, they ported it over to the West. Um, ported is his word. So the Philippines was the guinea pig. Countries like ours in the global South, Nigeria was another 
guinea pig, uh, and yet the targets were you. So what happened in 2016? The election of Rodrigo Duterte followed a little more than a month later by Brexit, followed by the, all of the elections that began to bring in the digital, the authoritarian, the populists, the us against them style of leadership. Um, and that, uh, you know, of course, you had Donald Trump, you had uh, Bolsonaro come in, uh, Facebook did take action in the French elections um, with Macron by taking out 30,000 fake accounts. If they did that in the Philippines, would we be where we are today? Who knows? Anyway, so 2016 dominoes fell. Here we are in 2022. 2016 to 2022, years of disinformation that has literally in front of our eyes changed our history. Uh, and this is documented. I will tweet, you know, the the series that we have done, giving the data, giving the evidence, exposing the networks of disinformation. And the most recent one, Facebook exposed themselves when they took down uh, what they called information operations coming from China. So this isn't just domestic, right? Coming from China that were uh, burnishing the image of the market. So this is September, 2020. Why did Facebook take that down? You know, it was because it was doing several things simultaneously, which is what these information operations do. Uh, the first, uh, the first thing it was doing was polishing the Marcos image. This is September 2020. Remember this that day. The second is campaigning for Sara Duterte, the daughter of of President Duterte. It was attacking me and Rappler. But what was the fourth thing it was doing? It was creating fake accounts for the US presidential elections using AI generated photos. You know all of this. And yet we sit here and pretend it's the old world. Anyway, let me just finish this long. It's not quite a rant, but um, we are now in a different time and place. Uh, in the Nobel lecture, I warned about the impact, the foundational threat to markets and elections of all of the lies because the, the world's largest delivery platform for news is Facebook. Now in the Philippines, YouTube is number one now, right? But this is like a whole information ecosystem. The journalists have lost our gatekeeping powers as early as 2014. And uh, this ecosystem actually has an incentive structure that rewards lies laced with anger and hate over really boring facts over journalism. So here we are in 2022. There are more than 30 elections globally. And we, I hope, I hope this isn't true, but it is true. Uh, we're the first domino to fall again. Uh, and, you know, it's coming for you. Brazil has elections in October. You have your midterm elections. You already know what happened on January 6th. So it's an existential moment for democracy. It's an existential moment for journalism. It is, we must come together because to solving this problem is not something we can do in the Philippines, but we will let you know where you are headed. Watch us closely. What is happening to us is happening to you. Thank you. you I just, you are ahead of us. We need to learn from you. So my first question, I wanna, I'm gonna talk about you and the threat you face in a minute, but as an editor, what do you say to your young reporters? So lies and hate travels faster online than fact. Do you tell them, you know, stick to the facts? Write the stories as straight as possible? I mean, how do you, what is the most effective long-term way to counter disinformation? Well, first, I mean, there's so many ways I can answer that question because just last night, you know, we brought our reporters together and those were the questions, you know. Uh, actually, the first thing is, you know, a self-assessment. Have we done our jobs? Well, uh, if this is what our public wants, are we not doing something? Are we not listening? And you know what? Um, 
after we listen to our reporters, the reality is that news organizations feel we still have power. It's a vestigial tale. It's a vestigial power. The distribution is not in our control. We have been systematically attacked credibility, tearing down the credibility of, and I'm going to use that phrase that you are being attacked with, mainstream media. This is a global meta-narrative that has been seeded, and it shifts country to country. The attacks, okay, let me answer quickly, before, and then, you know, we can, we can talk more. So the first one is that uh, the breakdown of trust. Yes, journalists, we've made mistakes, we're human. But that breakdown of trust globally is not within our control. No matter what you do, you can sit there and come out with the most wonderful investigative stories. It won't get distribution on these platforms. And right now, they're the world's largest distributor of news. Worse than that, these platforms actually are creating emergent human behavior. It is this toxic sludge, anger, hate, conspiracy theories are literally changing every person on these platforms, right? So let me not go into behavior, but let me, let's me let say what's in our control. So for our reporters, you know, yes, you must play with the form. This is why Rappler was created a decade ago. We played with the form. You keep the substance. You have to go. People's attention span in an attention economy, which is the world we live in today, they don't want the data. They don't want to work. So how do you do it? Our younger reporters are on TikTok, right? But he, he, that's not enough. So what do we do? Um, I, I look at three pillars. You would have heard me say this before. The three pillars, these were the pillars of Rappler and these are the pillars of fighting back. Tech, journalism, community. So on technology, for me personally, right, as our reporters, as Rappler continues to do great journalism, I mean, it becomes harder and harder, right? As, as, as the team continues with reporting, that's, that to me is like putting a finger in the dam and that dam is still going to come crashing down. Our, our, what I'm focused on is legislation. There must be guardrails placed around this technology. We, we can't just say, you know, this, it's business as usual because it's not. The evidence is clear. That's the first. Uh, I think I've testified in nearly every nation in the free world that is looking for solutions to this. And frankly, it's not just, you know, the governments have also abdicated their responsibility. These attacks that are happening, some part of the reason, say, the United States, it's so hard for you to get to a place where you can get effective legislation is because some politicians benefit from this. Right, but this is systematically killing us. It's like soma. I mean, anyway, all right. So tech, um, the most successful one so far is is the European Union uh, Action Democracy Action Plan. They have two that are that have just have been approved, but they're coming out too late to help us to help most of the elections this year. It's the um, Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. Okay, so there's that. Second, journalism. Um, systematically, we are being torn down. Credibility, you know, uh, International Center for Journalists and UNESCO did a big data case study of just all the attacks against me. They, they looked at almost half a million, yeah, half a million social media attacks. And they characterized it. 60% of those attacks were meant to tear down my credibility. That creates, that's astroturfing. That creates a bandwagon effect. Government amplifies 40% were meant to tear down my spirit. So it is really wonderful to listen to you giving the awards to students because man, it is a tough time to be a journalist. That's journalism. Um, I've agreed to co-chair along with Mark Thompson, who's the uh, former director general of BBC, former New York Times president, uh, the International Fund for Public Interest Media, because it's not just the form and substance of journalism that needs to be rethought. It is the business, which has essentially crumbled, right? If you're still only focused on advertising, we've got to move on. Um, so the business must survive. That's journalists must continue doing what we're doing, even if it doesn't get distribution. That's tough to tell your reporters. Third is the community. Right. One of the things we need to do is literally to embrace our community. And, you know, news managers will tell you it's about understanding your readers. It's not that 
at all, not only. It's not about, I think what, what social media has done is this race to the bottom. It's, it's catering. I was going to say to mob rule, but think about it like this. I, I had this discussion with our reporters. We don't show page view metrics to Rappler reporters because I don't want them to be caught in a popularity game. It's not about the mob. It's, it's about what is important. So, you know, when we had our reporters last night, it's the managers, our desk editors see the metrics. We do look at growing uniques, but our reporters are free to develop the craft of journalism, which has gotten harder and harder. Anyway, the last, that was part of our community. Look, your community in the United States, it's like we're, the information ecosystem is used to be the public sphere was was uh we were the gatekeepers and we were responsible for that and we took that responsibility seriously we had standards and ethics that influenced the way we behave look i'm getting emotional because because talking to you ha <sighs> well now if the lies think about it like there's coronavirus a virus of lies that is seeded by power infects real people, right? Um, I actually compare it to kind of like radicalization of terrorists. And there are many countries around the world that have de-radicalization programs, which take years and years and years. I lived and worked in Indonesia for a decade. Um, our people, our communities are infected with the virus of lies and Doing stories alone isn't enough to shift that. So the, the fundamental question of our reporters last night, so Maria, do we ignore them, you know, or do we embrace them? I mean, them being Marcos supporters who are insisting that Marcos, the father, was the greatest leader we have ever had and that we are going to return to the golden age with Marcos Jr. These are lies. You are amazing, thank you. Um, I wanna... <laughs> there are microphones, I just wanna at let folks in the audience ask you a, a couple questions. Um, anybody wanna put their hand up who's like to ask a question? Hi, Maria. It's an honor to speak with you. Uh, Steve Dunlop, past president. Um, you brought up Marcos, obviously. We have a lot of political families in the world, and I'm wondering how much name recognition has played into uh, the situation in the Philippines and in the other countries around the world. Do people just vote for a name now, and is that facilitating what you're describing? Thank you, Steve, and it's nice. I don't see you, but nice um, to hear your question. So I, let's let's think about it like this, right? From the whole world still exists. So yes, name recall was the way. I mean, the Philippines really is largely a feudalistic, patronage-driven society, and our constitution, for example, is patterned after the United States. But these principles of democracy are they embedded in our soul? Yes, to a degree that in the 36 years I've been a journalist, it's, it's been watching institutions kind of um, grow, right? Solidify a little bit more because the reality also is that uh, law and order is weak, corruption is endemic, families, dynasties, you'll see on Rappler that, you know, for example, the Senate, our Senate, the new group coming in, three families control a quarter of the seats, right? So it's it's very interesting. So yes, name recall is definitely a problem. The Marcos camp has always had a loyalist base. They've never lost it. And when I first arrived in the Philippines in 1986, you know, I was fascinated by this blind, almost cult-like loyalty. But that can also be partly explained because feudal patronage driven. 
right? During the almost 21 years Ferdinand Marcos was in power when he declared martial law in 1972, people benefited. The Ilocos region where he was from, you know, there are people who remember the good days. That's actually true. But to get those good days to that small number of loyalists, you know, you had $10 billion dollars plundered in 1986. These are numbers that the Philippine government has come out with. Of those $10 billion, less than $4 billion have been recovered by the Philippine government over that time period, right? Uh, the the seven, tens of thousands, about 70,000 who, dis who disappeared, the 3,200 people who were killed. In 1986 numbers, those were a lot, but then you compare extrajudicial killings under the Duterte administration. You know, depending on who you talk to, the police will say, oh, it's about five to 8,000, as if one death isn't enough. It's about five to 8,000, but you talk to a human rights groups who are documenting this, they'll go up to 27,000 in the first three years. And that's our first casualty in our battle for truth. I'm not responding to it. Let me quickly respond to the essential question. Elections. And I'm not just talking to Filipinos, elections. The studies have shown, I'll tweet this after, that, that we human beings don't actually go to vote uh, based on rational thinking, that emotions can drive 80 to 90% of our choices. This is before the age of social media, right? This is why you, know, you had ads. You know, the thing is when, when journalists were the gatekeepers, we can actually hold these actors to account. I don't know if you remember the negative ads when we were all talking about Michael Dukakis' campaign, right? I mean, you, I remember all of these things like it's yesterday. That was when you could actually hold people to account, hold our power politics to account. So what happens in the age of social media when the very platform that delivers the news i.e. the facts a voter would need to make a decision is actually a thinking fast, emotion-driven platform that is designed to actually spur these negative emotions so you keep scrolling on site. So that I call it the toxic sludge, hate, anger, conspiracy theories. I mean... In Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro was a far-right fringe figure, would never have made it to mainstream. But who dragged him in? YouTube. And then who took him up? Traditional media, right? This is an information ecosystem that's tainted. So let's go back to elections. Um, there was always a Marcos loyalist. There's a perfect storm globally. I think we, you know this as well, that elite this this narrative of elite politics just hasn't trickled down enough. As we dig further and further in this global information ecosystem, the meta narratives that are seeded that are being used against evidence based reasoning, uh, governments that are or news journalists who are trying to hold governments to account, they're all appearing the same across the world. And so back to the answer of your question, um, there's a perfect storm of both power and money. Um, we saw the Marcuses since they've come back in 1991, really methodically working to regain power. Uh, he narrowly lost in 2016 for a vice president by just 200,000 votes. Um, and now back in full force, 30 some odd million votes out of 60, almost 66 million registered voters. This would have been impossible without social media. And it's, it's this perfect storm. I'm just saying that, I, you know, I, again, I'll tweet the data, the evidence, um, but this isn't isolated to the Philippines. You know, it is, you can take apart the imperfections of our democracy because there are many, uh, but it's that final straw that is shifting the world globally. And I'm so worried about that because we still don't have a global solution. Um, I'm going to, oh, one more question, I guess. That would, yeah, thank you. 
Hi, Maria. Uh, thank you again for being here. I'm Allison Kojak with the Associated Press. And this is a little bit related to the answer you just gave, but in addition to sort of the social media aspect, there seems to be this pattern, and it's it, it, it appeared even in the 30s and 40s, where democracy is messy and a little unsettling and a little bit upsetting, and sometimes people find comfort in the idea of an authoritarian regime. And I think we're seeing some of that in Europe and some of that here in the US and it's perhaps most recently manifested in the Philippines. But I mean, beyond misinformation and everything, is there some sense that this is, people want that stability of an authoritarian, stable government? Thanks for your question. And yes, yes. Short answer, yes. So think about it like this. So I've lived through several cycles like this because of Indonesia. In Indonesia, Soharto was in power for almost 32 years. And then, you know, the this is the Asian financial crisis. In, in, in 1998, it ended and it spurred change, right? But then what happened after having him in power for 32 years, one president, Every year after that, for the next four years, there was a new president. And Indonesians wanted a, were so unsettled. They wanted a sense of, of stability, right? And I think it all kind of came to a head. And in Indonesia, I was looking at the jilbab as, as an example of this, the, of the Muslim, how many women were wearing this conservative headgear. And inevitably, always, it would rise every time change came too fast. Human beings, we, we actually say we want change, but we want stability more than we want change. Uh, so, so what happened in Indonesia? Well, Prabowo, the son-in-law of Suharto, almost won uh, for president in 2014. 2014 was the year where we saw this nostalgia for strongman rule really win big across the world. Modi was elected in 2014. Prabowo would have been elected in Indonesia. And ironically, what stopped it was social media, a photo of, 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 uh, of Jokowi, the guy, he's president now uh, in this huge stadium that spread virally. So it's a hit or miss for social media in that sense, right? I mean, the reason why we set up Grappler on Facebook first was I was hoping that democratizing effect would win. I couldn't have imagined where we are today. So let's talk about real people um, in the United States. Uh, we had Obama elected. We had uh, gay marriage approved. I watched some of my parent, my, my parents, their older friends, they, they live in Florida for the record. Um, so you now know, you know, and, and I watched the kind of like quicksand that they began to feel. Change is unsettling, right? Now you add this kind of incendiary system of information uh, exchange, which is, you know, to shout, to rage, to incite, to hate, to incite, to violence. And, and we journalists looked away from it because we thought it's only social media. But um, online violence is real world violence. All the evidence has shown us that. And what you're seeing play out in the real world started in the virtual world. So what happened to you in the United States? Yes, nostalgia for stability, well, you were also the victims or the targets of information operations, very concerted. I read that thousand page Senate report, you know, that provided the evidence, um, but nothing has been done. And I guess that's the last part I'll say is, you know, we can look into infinite possibilities of why we are where we are. And every little strand we pull will be slightly correct. But what is the game changer? What's the, what causes the tipping point for Autocrats Inc? It's tech. And we need to put guardrails around that. Uh, you know, the thing for, for nostalgia, for a strongman rule, we know this very well in Southeast Asia. We know this well in Asia. 
and you can see how we have slid in the democracy indexes globally. Thank you so much for your bravery, for your journalism. And, and for your example, because it is coming here, we all face this as journalists, we all have to help each other. And, and you know, you're now facing, you have these pending cases in the Philippines, the, your own future, you could be rearrested, the Rappler could be shut down. I just wanna thank you for the bravery you show us and the example you provide for us. And it's, you know, and just, you talked about emotion, you inspire us. And we all have to have your bravery and your belief in journalism and your belief in facts. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Can I, can I quickly say, please, we use the phrase hold the line, and I know it's used in other ways in the United States, but you know, this time matters so much, and what you do will impact and ripple globally. So, you know, when Alex asked me to, to do this, I, I really wanted to because where you go, journalism goes, right? We, you'll see the impact of all of the, the the information operations, the information warfare. Four months after Dmitry Muratov and I received the Nobel Prize, Novaya Gazeta shut down. Who knows what will happen to us, but we're preparing. Uh, so please, you know, I'm so thrilled to hear about the words that you're giving. We're watching, we're hoping. Thank you so much. Please hold the line. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We will hold the line.